It's a pleasure to start the third series of these Jiulin. Uh, today we want to look at the text at the difference. I wanted to present with these Jiulin the preparation for the Chag. We spoke about structure of all the Chagim, about a very challenging and interesting analogies by the Rambam, and now back to a simple text the Ten Commandments, which is might be one of the most famous texts, not only of the Bible of monk of mankind, in general terms, what an amazing short text would have an amazing influence impact on the Jewish people on humanity. Now, I want to focus on only one aspect, which is the difference or mainly focus on this aspect, which should explain the difference between Shmot and Dvarim. And that is interesting and meaningful for several reasons. First of all, we need to understand the text. And if there is a difference between the texts, we need to know why. Is it meaningful? Will it help us to find the delta, the difference? And is there a meaning in these differences? If there isn't, so might be all the languages, all that the, the texts are, I wouldn't say arbitrary, but the, but the choice of this word or another of this uh, syntax or another of adding a vav or changing a term is that's the way people talk. Uh, Chazal called it Dibra Torah Kilshon Bnei Adam. That's the way people talk. Or is there a very special meaning to every little change? And that has, of course, major implications, how we listen, how we try to analyze the text, to what extent we should take every little detail and, and word or letters meaningfully, or that might be too much. So that's a general question. Furthermore, in the scientific analysis, the classical Bible criticism, of course, compared such texts, called it the later one, um, um, a poor copy, a secondary copy influenced, and they made conclusions which are not necessarily uh, the highest expression of respect for the text, but a very critical approach to show later uh, influences. And last, not least, a difference like these might have very interesting educational, psychological, philosophical messages, which I would like to elaborate. And I would like to show that there is a huge difference, and it is actually an example, both for the Ten Commandments and for many, many other texts, there are many other uh, texts which are uh, presented twice. And we can learn a lot from these comparisons. What is the difference and what is their message? Uh, as this picture shows, there is a change between the exit of Egypt when they just left slavery, where they built the pyramids and there was fire to build it the Levanim, the bricks, and they came to house Sinai and there had fire, which is compared to the term of bricks, we'll see it in a moment. And that is presented in Shmot, right after the exodus of Egypt. But later on, after 40 years walking in the desert, which was a long period, a very meaningful period for uh, the development of the Jewish people from slavery to be a free nation in their homeland, when they are looking forward to come to Eretz Israel, There is a change, a mental change of these two generations, of these two traditions. And I took, uh, and there is a lot to think about it and to take learn messages, which are extremely meaningful. I want to elaborate those. I spent quite a lot of time and I am a big believer in such a slide, which I'm trying to show now, which is, seems to be very simple and, trivial, but I, uh, but I believe there is a lot that we can learn if we think a moment, what is the difference between Shmot and Dvarim, not the text, here is the difference one, two, three, four, five, and so on, there is a difference where we are in the raison d'etre, or where is it located? When the Jewish people left Egypt, <coughs> they came shortly afterwards, about 50 days later, they came to Har Sinai. According to the tradition of Chazal, it was Shavuot. Shavuot in the, in the Bible is not presented at the day of Matan Torah. It's presented of the first fruits in Eretz Yisrael. 
We spoke about that in the first year. Here we have, shortly after the Exodus, we have Matam Torah Bahar Sinai. Uh, the, the, the Jewish people heard it. Moshe got the two tablets and he gave it to Am Yisrael. And the journey continues for a little bit unexpected for 40 years. It's a long journey. And during these 40 years, a lot happens. It's another generation. It is a totally new generation, not the generation born in slavery and experienced slavery. It's a new generation after 40 years. The majority are, are, are those who were younger than 20 years. It's another generation, another mentality. And they came to Eretz Yisrael, they enter. Just, <coughs> just before they enter Eretz Yisrael, in the book of Dvarim, the entire Torah is repeated, or part of it is repeated. The entire Sefer Dvarim is a repetition, a summary. And now Am Yisrael is in a different state. If at the beginning there were slaves and the bread they were eating at the exit of Egypt, Pesach, were matzot, because there was no time, they were running out, rushing out. During the 40 years, they had this miraculous food, man, which you don't know where it comes from, how you prepare it. It was a preparation for something. Six days you collect, and the seven days it's not there. It's exactly the same term as six days you work, and the seven days you rest. The man explains the Shabbat on a very practical level. And after 40 years, <clears throat> just when they crossed uh, the time of Yehoshua, chapter 5, when they crossed uh, the Yarden in, in, in Yericho, Jericho, they started to eat the regular food. And at that time, they are free people. When Moshe repeats the Ten Commandments to Am Yisrael, just before they enter Eretz Yisrael, they are totally different people. In another location, another generation, a different state of mind, a different religious psychological attitude. Not slaves from yesterday, there are three people in their own homeland tomorrow. And that is exactly the difference. So before we look at the text, we know what to expect, or we know what is the, what's the background, what's the, the context. Shmot, they just came out of Egypt. Dvarim, they are just about to be free people in their own land. And here comes Moshe Rabbeinu and repeats it for them telling what you heard 40 years ago is true, is the basis for the Jewish religion, is the basis of the Torah. But after 40 years, the same teacher who was up in Har Sinai, he can tell them, I have a reflection on that. I have an update or I have new words for you. I have new messages for you. And Moshe Rabbeinu in his last year, he knows the big teacher, he knows to present it differently. I know the biblical, the uh, classical scientific approach has a totally different language, but I want to present it in this way. And I follow here Beno Yaakov, Moshe Rabbeinu, the best teacher. The best teacher who knows to talk to a new generation. And 40 years later, he knows there are mild differences which you make changes. Not everybody is allowed to, be, to make changes, but Moshe Rabbeinu, the big teacher, he is the person who can make changes. So I follow here a lot of very interesting research. Rambam Maimonides talks about it in the Guide of the Perplex, chapter 30, 31. And Don Yitzchak Abrabanel, the phenomenal commentator of, uh, from Spain, after the, after the expulsion from Spain, a phenomenal analysis to Sefer Dvarim, the differences. And last but not least, Professor Benno Jakob, uh, an outstanding Jewish scholar, uh, commentator, who was born in Germany and escaped Nazi Germany and died in England. Nachama Leibovich called him the biggest commentator of the 20th century. And she said it might be the biggest commentator of, uh, Jewish, his of Jewish history at large. So I want to present a few of these findings and add a little bit to it. And here's the text. So that's the overall context. 
And here's the text. And here I face problems. The text is in Hebrew. Just a moment. The text is in Hebrew. I presented here the text in Hebrew, read what is specific and different in Shmot, and in green, what is specific and different in Dvarim. These are the major changes and specific features, meaning everything in black is the same. And these are the differences. Beno Yaakov made a very simple statement. It starts with Anuchi Hashem Elokecha, I'm God who took you out of Egypt. The first word is God's I, Anuchi. And the last word is Vechol Asher Lereecha, and whatever belongs to your fellow men. Meaning, the major message is summarized in two words. What happens between the word when God says, I, and what happens that we live together as a nation, as fellow men, we live all together. What happens to my fellow men? The transition from Anochi, Hashem, to God. And that is translated here in the next slide. I made here a few comments. To, to highlight the differences, which is based on texts in between. And here it is the same, um, the cartoon from that is what happened in Egypt, Shmot, Exodus, and that's what happened later. I want to elaborate afterwards in the Shiu in, in the last few minutes, the difference between Na'aseh, Na'aseh and Nishma, we should do and we should understand and listen. And on one hand in Shmot, and in Dvarim, the opposite is we should listen and we should do, which is exactly the opposite. It's very famous, the saying of Chazal, that you should do it and afterwards you will understand. Na'asev and Nishma. Interesting enough, in Dvarim, exactly the, the opposite uh, order is presented. So once we understood the difference between the Decalogue, between the Ten Commandments, we will understand that as well. And here is the translation. The translation is a challenge because it's very hard to point out these fine, very subtle differences. You have the text here with, with you in English. You can print it out. It is shared, Susan, right? So you can print it out and take this text or just follow what I'm presenting. I will work with the Hebrew text, explain it, but you have everything here and pointed out in the same way as I did for the Hebrew text, which, which you just saw before. So let's start to find the differences. If we look at the text here, we can say, find the difference. And afterwards we start to compare and we try to explain. There might be reasons, differences, which we can explain very well, which jump in our eyes. That's a meaningful one. And there might be others which are more difficult to explain or we don't know. So I prefer to say I don't know because my limited understanding will not explain everything. I would not say there is no reason. I think that from those differences, which we can easily explain, we should get a certain level of trust that there is a difference. And if I can't explain it, it is because I don't know, but the, the, the conclusion is not, there is no difference. I don't understand it, or I can't explain it properly. So let's, let, let's take a look at it from above. In Shmot it says, Elohim et kol ha'ele God spoke all these 10 commandments, dvarim, aseret ha'dvarim, and he starts talking. And we see here, that is the first uh, three commandments. And afterwards, there is a parashat tucha. A new section starts. There is a full stop. And there is a new section starting here. In Dvarim, it is not Hashem who is talking. It is Moshe who is reviewing the story 40 years ago at Har Sinai. And he says, you know, Anochi omed ben Hashem uvenechem ba'etai. I was standing <coughs> between you. I upa. I was standing between the Lord and you at that time to tell you the word of the Lord because you were afraid due to the fire. 
but you were not there. So what is the difference? Anuchi omet. What is the first word of the Ten Commandments? Anuchi Hashem Elokecha. The great teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, our teacher, he says, I was somewhere in between. That's not only a geographical description, that he was a mediator. Anochi, I, says Moshe, was in between to bring you the word of Hashem. Anochi, Hashem Elokecha, I am the Lord. Moshe brings a personal message, the way he presents it to Am Yisrael. And how interesting, in the text, all the parashot are connected. Yes, there is a short break between some of the psukim, as presented here. That is called parashas gura. It's not a new line. That is not a full, a full stop. Interesting enough, according to the rabbinical tradition, and you can read it in the text, in Dvarim, these words are, in the first language, God says who he is. Anochi Hashem Elokecha. Al Panai. And he talks in, in his, he, he speaks. Later on, from Shabbat, it's not Hashem who is talking. Somebody else is quoting what Hashem said, not in the first person, I, rather in the third, because Hashem rested on Shabbat. So this difference, Chazal explained, the first are, uh, are, were spoken, delivered directly from Hashem, and the others were delivered. Uh, Moshe told Am Yisrael what he heard at Har Sinai. That is true for Shmot, because there it happened. That was another experience. It was another voice. It was another um, revelation of Matan Torah Sinai. If that is true for Shmot, that is a good point to have a full stop in between. But in Sefer Dvarim, in the book of, in the fifth book, everything is reported re retroactively. Moshe told them, listen, these days, 40 years ago, a long, long time ago, I was between the mountain and the Jewish people. But now he's talking one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one to the Jewish people, just repeating what happened. So everything is a report. Nothing is original. Everything is a, a reproduction of what happened many years ago. That explains that in Sefer Shmot, it says, Le shomrei mitzvotai. God says, all those who keep my, uh, my commandments, why in, uh, other, uh, why in, uh, in uh, Dvarim, it says, Kri and Ktiv, there are two versions, the written and the oral version not my commandment, rather his commandments. So you see that this tiny difference, both in mitzvotai or mitzvotav, and here is a continuum. It's one text, because everything is a report. Hashem doesn't talk in Sefer Dvarim. He spoke in Shmot. Therefore, that is a difference in the way it is written and a difference of my commandments. When I collected all these differences, I found 10 major differences which are presented here in this, uh, in this table, the summary table. There are many more differences which I would like to elaborate now. In Sef, so uh, we spoke about Parsha Ptucha and whether it is one text or a different one and Mitzvotai. I would like to show you now, oops, and sorry, I don't know what happened, my apologies. I want to show you now another text. In Sefer Dvarim, both for the Shabbat and for the order that we should respect parents, it says, Ka'asher Tzivcha Hashem Elokecha. And here, Ka'asher Tzivcha Hashem Elokecha. You should respect the Shabbat, keep the Shabbat the way God told you to do. And you should honor your parents the way God told you to do, as the Lord your God commanded you. Observe the Shabbat. And it says the same here. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you. Why? Didn't he command it in, Sh in Shmot? Why is it necessary to call it now as God commanded you? And Abraham explains very clearly, the simple difference is, 
By the way, it appears very often, Kasher Tzifcha Hashem Elokecha, Asher Tzifcha Hashem Elokecha in Dvarim, because in Shmot and earlier, they listened what Hashem told them. So there is no need that Hashem says, or Moshe, in the name of Hashem, the way God orders you to do it. It's just happening that you hear Matan Torah at the Mount Sinai. There is no reason that Hashem emphasis, and by the way, that's what I want. That's what I order you to do. However, after 40 years, when it's all memory, it's a, re, a, represent, a, a, a reflection, of his, a historical reflection, what happened 40 years ago, what was told 40 years ago, you should keep Shabbat, and you should honor your parents, which are the active mitzvot aseh, active commandment what to do. On a practical term, you should do that. It was over the 40 years, it started to be a tradition. It started to be a mitzvah. That is what should be done. It is a mitzvah. So ka'asher tzifcha, Hashem elokecha, is a very, very meaningful difference after 40 years it's not just a great experience everybody had at Har Sinai it is for the new generation something they should take with them it's a take-home message from 40 years ago that is our destination that is our uh, tradition and that these are commandments from Hashem they realize that later on so that these are important differences we come now to a very interesting, a well-known difference between Shmot and Dvarim. In Dvarim it says, for Shabbat, many differences, Zachor et Yom HaShabbat, Lekadosho. Remember the day of Shabbat, and you should make the day a holy one. In Dvarim it says, Shamo et Yom HaShabbat, and there is a different reasoning for that not to remember what was in the past, rather to observe in the future. What is the difference for that? Furthermore, in Shmot, the reasoning for, uh, Matanto, for Shabbat is because we should remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Sorry, in Shmot it is because in six days, God made the heavens and earth the sea and everything that is that that is in, in them and he rested on the seventh day therefore the lord blessed the shabbat day and he sanctified it we should sanctify it to keep it holy it's the same word in hebrew uh et yom shabbat because seven days god created the world and he rested the seventh day and you should make it, uh, and God made it holy. I should make it holy because Hashem, when he rested, he made it whole. That's the creation. Creation is the reason for the Shabbat. There is a totally different reasoning for it. You should keep the Torah. You should keep it. Why? Because God took you out of Egypt. And you should remember how interesting. The Zachor, remember, from Exodus, is replaced by we should keep it. But when we keep it, we remember. What do we remember? Not the creation of the world. We remember the Zaharta, that we were slaves in Egypt and God took us out and uh, with a lot of miracles. And therefore, since he took us out with all the miracles, therefore we should do it. And we should do it and our slave. Leman Yanuach Avdecha Vamatcha Kamocha. Your slave should rest exactly as you did. Here it says uh, you, he, you should the slave may rest, your mate, your slave and your maidservant may rest like you. Kamocha. That is missing here. Here we come to a most wonderful fundamental difference between Sefer Shmot and Sefer Tvarim. Sefer Shmot, they leave Egypt. It, they're just about to realize that God is God 
that they have a religion, that they have a monotheistic religion coming out of Egypt and having seen all the Avodah Zarah in Egypt, all the uh, idolatry and the worship for the sun and you name it, endless, it's quite an important step to accept monotheism, one God. That's an important message uh, in Sefer Shmot. Of course, the beginning is, I'm God who took you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage, no slavery anymore. That is the most important message. No need to explain it to them. They were just liberated from, from Egypt. Miraculous uh, Yetziat Mitzrayim, that is the main, main identity of Am Yisrael and of their religion and of God. But you should remember it's much more Sefer Shmot. He is the, lead, the creator and the leader of the world. Whether Hashem really needs a rest after seven days or not is not the question. But it is about creation. It's about existence at large in Sefer Shmot. He rested. So if he rested, why shouldn't we rest? That is the basic idea in Sefer Shmot, the imitation of God. He worked hard and he created a wonderful world, 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 and so should we do it. We work hard and we deserve a rest. If he needs a rest, which is, of course, uh, only an analogy, it is Kalvachoma. We are allowed to have a day of rest and to reflect and to think about the world. When it comes to Sefer Dvarim, there is a totally different message. We have a history. We walked 40 years in the desert and we came out of the land of bondage, of slavery. And we believe that every human being has the right to be a free human being. No slavery, one or the other. That is what we should remember forever. After 40 years in the desert, Am Yisrael developed to be change to be a free nation, a new generation, a new understanding of life, not slavery for the king. They understand they're on their own. And you might have for, for the economics, for the agriculture, you might have people who help you. But now you have to make sure who has to rest now. Who has to rest is your slave and your maidservant they have leman yanuach kamocha. They may rest like you. What a huge philosophical message. What an incredible message. If in Shmot it was God who kivyachol quasi needed a rest, and that was our understanding of monotheism, of the world, now that we build our future, we should never forget our past in Egypt. Should we have a slave? We have to make sure that he rests. And these two words, which are classically the difference, we spoke about Vayanoch, Vayom Hashvi'i, God rested, and therefore God, the Creator, made the Shabbat, which should be holy. Now that I start our life, that we start our life in Eretz Yisrael as a free nature, in, nation in our homeland, if we should have an Evet, a slave, we have to make sure that he rests. That is not the reasoning in Shmot, that's the reasoning in Dvarim. Make sure humanity, everybody has the same right. If I rest, my servant and my maidservant, uh, uh, everybody rests. I have a commitment for my slaves not to be slaves the way we were slaved. They have a right to rest exactly the way I want to rest. Exactly the way God was resting, Kivyachol, at the creation, according to Shmot. Now I have to make sure that in the future, my slave will rest. Everybody is equal. Everybody has the right. Chazal have a very sharp statement, strongly about slavery. And they say, Hakone evet, kone adon If somebody buys a slave, he buys himself a master. What a strange and sharp statement, Masechet Kiddushin. If I buy a slave, according to the understanding of slavery in these days, I'm the master, I have a slave, and he should work as much as I want, and he should respect the master, me. 
the Torah says a totally different message. You don't forget in Sefer Tvarim that you were once slaves. You have to remember, or going back to this, to this model, we came out of Egypt. We believe that there is God and only him. But after 40 years, we have to remember very well, everybody is free. Everybody is free. Nobody is a slave. And if he is a slave, he has to do the job. But he has the rights of human being. If God rested in our religious understanding as a creator of the world, everybody has this right to rest. That's what Moshe teaches them with a totally different message, uh, meaning and reasoning of Matan Torah. That's what he tells them after 40 years. You make better sure that the system works, society works, humanity works. That's our obligation. It's not that God was a creator. Yes, we believe that because we accept God as a, a monotheistic concept. After 40 years, it is much more to accept the monotheistic concept. We have to make sure no slavery the way we were slaves. That explains beautifully the difference of the reasoning for Shabbat in Shmot and Sefer Dvarim. Please make sure, please pay attention that in Sefer uh, Dvarim, there is an addition, not only we, it is also mentioned Shorcha Vachamocha. Shorcha Vachamocha are not mentioned in Sefer Shmot. We have agricultural animals, and these animals, they are allowed to rest as well. So we have to make sure that not only our slaves, those who work for me, that they rest like me, but we have to make sure that every animal, um, that, your, that your ox and your donkey, not mentioned in Shmot, but now we come to Eretz Yisrael, we have animals. We will be free in our own uh, agricultural world and activity. They have a right to rest as well. And in Sefer Shmot, later on, it says, uh, that also your field, in his field. In Sefer Bamidbar, it's in Sefer Dvarim, we have a field. In Sefer Shmot, the field is not mentioned because the Jewish people, when they left Egypt and they're in the middle of the desert, out of, ex, uh, of Egypt and just came a few hundred kilometers in the desert, who has a field there? Who lives there? Nobody, we are on our journey. We are on our journey to Eretz Israel. Who talks about the field? But when we talk about Eretz Yisrael, just about to enter the, the homeland, everybody sees the homeland. I will have a field. I will have a home. I will have a new existence on my own. Now we talk about field. We talk about uh, an ox and other animals, which are part of the life in the new homeland, which we are just about to enter. No need to mention that in the past. So these were the differences. Which, we, which I wanted to point out between avdecha v'amatcha uvehem techa v'gircha. And now we have also the ox and the donkey. And we have also the sadeh, which is mentioned here lower, uh, here at that point. We come now to a very, very interesting, all the differences are very, are fascinating. It says in Sefer Shmot, you do what has to be done and if you do it, you will uh, have long life. That's what we see here. Uh, you will have a long life. That is what we see here. <coughs> In honor your father and your mother, so that your days will be extended on the land <coughs> and that the Lord your land God gives you. That is totally different. In, in Dvarim, it says, honor your father and your mother as the Lord, your God, commanded you. We spoke about that. It's now a mitzvah. Now we have a codification. It's a mitzvah. So that your days will be extended and that it will be good for you on the land which the Lord God gives you. Why is Moshe Rabbeinu adding here, uh, Leman Yitavlach? In Shmot, it was not Leman Yitavlach. Was it not in the best interest of the Jewish people? Oh, if Moshe says it in Shmot, didn't say it in Shmot, why now should he say it altogether now? It will be good for you. Several times 
in Sefer Dvarim, we have this addition, it should be good for you. And here, I think Moshe makes a very important message. When he was standing with the Jewish people who just left slavery and were liberated from the terrible conditions they experienced in Egypt, and they saw 10 plagues, and they crossed the Yom Suf, and they are now free people, they got used, they, they were just about to get used, no slavery. You don't have to get up in the morning at sunrise and work all day long till sunset. You don't have to tell them it's great. Everybody experienced the freedom and enjoys it. But when you come to Eretz Yisrael, Moshe Rabbeinu, the good, great old teacher, tells them, remember, whatever you learned in the past, no slaves anymore. If we come to Eretz Yisrael, it will be really good. The mitzvot are in our best interest. The mitzvot will educate us to have a better life, to improve the values and to improve uh, the quality of life in a religious, social way. We have to make the world a better one, take care of slaves. We have to keep it. We don't only remember it. In Shmot, they had a memory of Egypt. Six days they were working, and the seventh day Moshe tried to get the free day for them. That didn't really work. But when they were getting the man in the desert, as you see here on, sorry, as you see here, <coughs> at the man, it says, Shabbat, Shabbat, Shabbaton, Shabbat, Kodesh Lashem, Sheshit Yamim Telaketehu, Uvayom Shvi'i, Shabbat, Lo Yihievo. That is what I wanted to point out here. <coughs> a day of rest, it should be, a holy Shabbat to the Lord when they got the man. Sixth day, you shall collect it, you should gather it. And on the seventh day, it is Shabbat. There will be none of it, no man. So they had a short memory. Yes, only seven weeks between Mitzrayim, the exodus of Egypt, but they learned to get familiar with the idea of Shabbat. Shabbat was not yet given till they came to Hal Sinai. Did they have a Shabbat? Not clear, not sure, it doesn't say it, but they had a simple idea. You collect six days the man, the six days you collect the double portion, and the seventh day you even don't have to work to get the man for free. They learned the cycle. I can rest. Prepare the Shabbat. That was a preparation to get ready for the big concept of Shabbat, which were only explained to the Jewish people at Har Sinai, seven days after Egypt. Remember what you learn from your daily bread, from your daily food. When we come to Eretz Yisrael, we are not remembering what was in Egypt. We are not talking about the past all the time. Of course, we remember the Shabbat that we were that uh, we are not slaves anymore. But we prepare our future. We observe it. Lishmo means I prepare it for the future. That's a totally different mind. Not was in the past and what we experience. It is now prepare build a better future. That is a very meaningful difference. I shall talk now about another difference, which is very, very much a continuation of this idea. In Sefer Shmot, it says, Lo eit shakel. You should not hear, you should not bear false shekel witness against your neighbor. It means, don't lie him, you owe me something and it's not true. In Sefer Dvarim, it says, and you should not bear false witness against your neighbor. False here is shav, vain, nothing. What happens if I'm telling my neighbor, you know what, I swear in the name of God, my name is Benny Gesundheit. Nothing wrong with that. I can prove it. According to Sefer Shmot, I didn't say him anything wrong. It is meaningless. It has no message. But I mentioned the name of God. Today, it is a Thursday. What's the message? Meaningless. It is not the Sheker. It's not the lie. So it's not false. In Sefer Dvarim, and might be the translation should be more than false, it is a vain. It is meaningless. 
Don't waste your time in Sefer Dvarim to say, today it's Thursday, the heaven is blue. That is, it's true, but it's meaningless. In Sefer Dvarim, we are not only not lying, we have to educate ourselves to say something meaningful. Don't talk about batlanut, shav, nothing. Make it meaningful, make it tachlis, make messages out of, out of your life. When we came out of Egypt, the big memory was that as slaves, the Egyptian told Am Yisrael, let them work. Let the work become weighty upon the, the people and they will engage in it. That is what Paro told them. And not have time to be occupied with Shekel matters. To leave Egypt, to be free, that's all Shekel. What they were facing in Egypt is Olama Shekel, a world of liars of wrong things. So to say today it's a Thursday, nothing is, there is no lie into it, it's not meaningful. In Sefer Dvarim it says, we should not waste our days with nothing. We should not do meaningful things. We should be tachlis, productive, creative. That is what Sefer Dvarim makes, wants us to do, and that is the major difference. We come here to one of a very small difference, as there are more to see. But I want to, uh, to express my enthusiasm that sometimes very, very little differences, and they seem totally meaningless to us. Dafka, particularly these meaning differences, are extremely, extremely powerful. And I want to stick to that because I love, I love these small differences, and it's a good uh, uh, experience to see the difference. The commandments of lotir tzach, you shouldn't kill, murder, lotin af. We shouldn't steal, we shouldn't lie, we shouldn't lotachmod. They're all one after the other, starting with a law. Don't do that, don't do B, don't do C, don't do D, don't do E, don't do that. Fine, it's like a vocabulary. You have a dictionary and you learn A to A, B, C, D, E. What happened in Sefer Dvarim? Moshe Rabbeinu says exactly the same. There is no substantial difference, but he connects them all together. What is the difference here? As you can see it here, not only you shall not steal, it says you shall not murder, and you shall not commit adultery, and you should not steal, and you shall not be your false uh, witnesses, and you shall not carve uh, the chule. What is the difference? And I think here Abrabanel points that out in a beautiful language. He says, after 40 years, we are not at a dictionary. It's not that we learn a vocabulary of five commandments, which we better don't do. It's now something totally different. What we have to commit to is we should not only not murder, chas shalom, we should also not commit adultery. Murder is to take one's life. Adultery is almost as bad. It's not the full murder, but the traumatic experience, a terrible violation of human values and privacy. So adultery is forbidden as well, but we should also not steal his possession. So what happens? Putting these five commandments in a context by a vavachibur end is actually an ongoing educational experience. From A, which is a fundamental violation of human rights, murder, we should move forward to step away, to stay away from adultery. But then not only his wife should not be violated, his uh, relationship, also his possession and also his word, his respect, and even not lotachmot. So there is an ongoing process. Actually, Rambam, Maimonides in the Mishneh Torah, he explains that exactly in this way, but he doesn't connect it to the Vava Chibur. Abrabanel says in Sefer Dvarim, we are people who studied 40 years. We learned the big picture. 
we know we learned the word I like very much is the contextuality of the laws. We talk the language of the mitzvot. We understand the spirit of the mitzvot. We learn that the mitzvot are here to improve our behavior, to improve our values and our virtues. We say that in the beautiful Zmirot by Rabbi Yudha Alevi, we say that in Yonah Matzah Bo Manoach, we say it, v'chol pikudav yachad ligmo. We study all the commandments together. In Sefer Shmot, we didn't have a big overview, just slaves running out of Egypt. One, two, three, four, five. That's what we have, you better do it. Short, precise, remember, do it by. Sefer Dvarim, no. Move from one mitzvah, Ratza Kadosh Baruch Hu lezakot et Israel. God wants to teach the Jewish people by the mitzvot how to improve our personalities. This little vav is such a meaningful difference between Sefer Shmot and between Sefer Dvarim. In Sefer Dvarim, it is an ongoing educational religious process that we educate, ed educate our values to be better people. And furthermore, what a beautiful observation. Ababanel says, now it is all one. It's the Torah. You learned over 40 years to, to understand the concept of the Torah. When, if I learn a new language, I learn the first 10 words and the 100 words, and I start to say a few words. I don't know the syntax. I don't know how to have a conversation in the language with 10 words. I can say a few words. That's it. After 40 years, we talk the language. We have to see how one mitzvah improves us to get better with the next mitzvah, and it's an ongoing process in the context as a unit. What a meaningful message. And we spoke about the other differences. Abobanel points out another difference of Lotachmot Beit Echa. We should not, Lotachmot, uh, the home of our neighbor. In Sefer Dvarim, it is Eshet Reecha. We have to be to, before we talk about his home, we have to think about the respect the human qualities, the respect for human being. Forget about his land, his home. Think first about his, about the personal interaction, which is presented in Sefer Varim by this order here. And he has a beautiful language. I don't actually don't know if uh, Abobanel was translated to English. It is a masterpiece of the analysis. And he says, in Dvarim, Moshe educates us be a mensch. Not only don't violate the right of your neighbor, understand why. By understanding that we have to be respectful and we should not desire, I shouldn't desire anything. What comes first is his wife, because we respect human society. We respect human beings. Lechanech et teva adam, to educate the nature of human beings. So that is, these are the summaries. There are more, more to say about it. Once we understood that, that there is a major change between Sefer Bamidbar, between Sefer Shmot and Sefer Dvarim, and Moshe, the great teacher, he knows where to pick us up after 40 years. It's not the same that you heard 40 years ago. It has now a new, a new message. What a beautiful difference with wonderful messages. I would like to use now the last few minutes to explain by these insights, to explain another difference, very short, between Shmot and Dvarim, a very meaningful one and very, very powerful one, which again explains the text, but is also an outstanding educational religious message, psychological message. And that's the difference between uh, what we learned in Sefer Shmot. <clears throat> It says in Sefer Shmot that we will do and we will heed, we will follow them. In Sefer Shmot 24, it says, Vaikach Sefer Habrit, Vaikra Bozne Ha'am, Vayomru, Kol Asher Diber Hashem, Naase Venishma. God took the book of the covenant and read it in the ears of the Jewish people, and they said everything that the Lord has 
spoken, דיבר, we will perform and we will hear and heed to it. That's an interesting difference. The difference here is we will do it. We are doers. That is what we say in Shmot Kavdalet 24 after the description of Hal Sinai. Just beforehand, the Jewish people says, They accept everything. All the people answered together and said everything that the Lord has spoken, we will perform. We are doers. We are slaves. No, we are not slaves today anymore, but we are, we have the personality of slaves. We are told to do something. We are told to do something. Do it. Done. And Moshe returned the statement of the people to Hashem, doers. And if it is Naase Nishma, Naase comes first here, and Naase comes alone without it. In Sef, and that is, of course, a classical rabbinical drasha. If somebody hears about the mitzvot, we don't have to understand it. We don't have to, uh, to understand all the reasoning. Just do the halacha, and by doing it, you will at the end understand. Lishmoa means to listen, to hear, to follow the advice, to observe, and it means also to understand. And that is a classical um, orthodox statement, practice oriented, you do it and afterwards you will understand. Naase <coughs> venishma, and further elaborated in Shmot before Har Sinai, Naase without Nishma. That is a classical message of Chazal and of Sefer Shmot. That changes totally, fundamentally in Sefer Tvarim. After 40 years, people understood that they have to understand. They have to get motivated and get interested to understand, to listen, to have a dialogue. And by doing so, they will understand, they will at the end do it. But now we, we are in the, in the mood of education. At the house Sinai, the Jewish people told Moshe and check in Dvarim 5, I didn't bring all the psukim. You, Moshe, approach and hear everything that the Lord, you, our God, will tell us. And you will speak to us everything that the Lord, our God, will speak to you. You, it would speak to you, sorry. And we will hear it and we will perform it. We will hear it, we will understand it, and perform it. You will hear, we will hear, and we will do it. And please pay attention, it's not what God spoke. Asher diber Hashem, it is Asher yedaber Hashem. It's the future. Har Sinai is not a one-point experience in history. It is the beginning of an ongoing process. It will continue. Asher yedaber Hashem elokeinu. In Sefer Tvarim, in another context, it says the Torah is not on the other side of heaven, is not in heaven, is not the, uh, the other side of the, of the ocean. Asher yashmi'enu that somebody has to tell it to us and that we will perform it. He will tell us, we have to hear it. He has to, talk, to tell us. In Sefer Tvarim, I cannot show this example, a beautiful example. Mitzvah Takela, once every seven years, we should come and listen. We should come and listen and do. But the children who join, they should come and listen. They don't have to do it. In the Shema Israel, the same way we have in Shmot Naase without the Nishma, we have in, uh, without the Nishma, we have in Sefer Dvarim, the Shema without the Naase. Shema Israel, Shema Israel Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Mecha. The Yerushalmi, the Babylonian Talmud ask, and where is the Shema Israel? Here is Israel, listen. And what are we doing? Yerushalmi says, if we hear, if we understand, if we internalize it, as you see from the rest of the first parasha of Shema Yisrael, you will love, you will love God, you will educate your children, you will study the Torah, and you will continue to study the Torah in your home and in your land and in your, in your, in your city, in your gates. It translates from the idea to the uh, to the practical aspects, 
That is another example. When we are slaves, we do what has to be done and our religious openness, our uh, spiritual capacities are limited. Just follow orders as slaves or as people who were slaves yesterday. Just do what has to be done. After 40 years, we are, we are well educated. We learned the Torah for 40 years. We understood Moshe Rabbeinu 40 years. We got the training. We were growing. A new generation is raised and we are ready to come to Eretz Yisrael. We learn, we internalize it. We are interested. We are eager to understand the spirit and to flow from one mitzvah to the other. After having that, this experience of the Ten Commandments of the entire Torah, we learn the Torah by listening, by learning it, and at the end by doing it. That is the big, big change. And I think these difference, which are actually contradictory, they are so beautiful because out of the contradiction, we see what the real message is. One time a child has to learn because he's a little child, I'm not going to explain him complicated concepts. How should he understand the idea of Shabbat? But if, you, uh, if he's grown up and he has a good understanding you can teach him, you can educate him, and that will be really the solid ground of Jewish education. I hope I was successful to tell you not only the differences between uh, the Ten Commandments, what a wonderful world, many, many details, there is a message. And the message is seen in our seven Ishma. We have to see the main point, the forest, and not only all the little trees, but we look at the little trees and we see that there is a clear message of the Torah in different stages in our life. And Moshe Rabbeinu, the big teacher, he knows when to say what to his teachers, to his students. Thank you for your attention. Any question, please? Hey, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Benny. Very, very interesting. There is uh, There are a number of statements when comments, but there is one question that I, I thought um, uh, was very interesting from Yudi Feldman, who asked um, regarding the reasoning, uh, you know, with the, when we discussed the, 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 the commandment regarding Shabbat. So he said, why don't the different, the four different Shabbat Shemona Esrays mention the exodus from Egypt? So that is a big question. I did not order this question. <laughs> that came spontaneously, right? It came. I, that, I don't know. Maybe you connected before the class and I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> not officially. Not officially. It might be a language of, so please, the three Shmonesat of Shabbat, and uh, we were considering Shiurim on Tefillah, the three concepts of the Shmonesat in Shabbat, they have the creation on Friday night, they have Har Sinai, Shabbat, Shabbat morning, Yismach Moshe Matnat Chilko, and they have the future Geula, uh, the, the future uh, redemption in Mincha, Ata Echad, Beshimcha Echad, Umikamcha Israel. There are three concepts. These are exactly the th same three concepts which we have in the Brachot before Kriyat Shema, creation of God, Yotzer Oru Vorechoshech, Am Israel were told them the Torah, and afterwards, the Gula. Uh, many, many, Rabbi Yosef Albo and others explained that as a beautiful commentary on the Sidur called Otsar Filot, the Gordon. And in a very beautiful way, Franz Rosenzweig, in his Star of Redemption, talks about these concepts. That's the idea of Shabbat. In the Kiddush, by the way, we say both. We say both. These ideas, and Chazal say, Zachor v'shamor, uh, uh, Zachor v'shamor were said together. It's true, it's said together after 40 years, each message at another point. Of course, when we hear Zachor, we should think about it to continue. So it comes together. The Shmonesra, I think they have another system. They take these three ideas from creation, Sinai and the redemption in the future together and want to elaborate these messages. That's another mindset than uh, what I spoke about Ten Commandments. So if we saw the, the Ten Commandments, 
that's not an obligation that in the Shmonesre we have to follow the same ideas. It's a true statement to compare the Ten Commandments. I think so, what I tried to elaborate, but for, <clears throat> for the Shmonesre, there is another mind, another mind works there, which should be elaborated in a different shiul, which is really phenomenal to explain. Um, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Okay, I'm the one who came up with that question, so I just want to elaborate. When it says in Kiddush, Ki hu yom tefilala mikra'e kodesh, zechel yetziyat mitzrayim, what that statement simply means is that Shabbat is on a much higher level, precedes those holidays that are zechel yetziyat mitzrayim. It is certainly not saying that Shabbat is zechel yetziyat mitzrayim. Quite to the contrary, it just says zikaron the Masay break shit. It's just adding on to the glory of Shabbat by saying how much more and superior it is to those holidays that basically are only of human origin because as a practical matter, we decide when they came out, the holiness of Shabbat is cosmic. It seems to me that if not one of the four three loads says anything about Zechel Yitzhiat Mitzrayim, you have to assume that the rabbis who commission these three loads, I'm not saying wrote them, commission them, somehow weren't happy with saying that Shabbat is Zechel Yitzhiat Mitzrayim. Because if they wanted to say that, they certainly could have stuck it in. It's, they could have done that simply on I mean, what's said in, in the Devarim, Asarat Hadibro. And the fact that they totally rejected the Devarim version of Shabbat in favor of the Shemot version, I think speaks volumes. Thank you very much for your, for your explanations. Allow me to uh, present what Benno Jacob says in a, different, in a different nuance, in a different approach. And I would like to go back to this text here. In Shmot it says, because God created the world, we should sanctify the Shabbat, Zahod Yom HaShabbat Lakacho, because God did it. He rested and he sanctified the seventh day. In Dvarim, we have a very special term. We should keep it, not remember, we should do it. Shamor, we should maintain it, preserve it for the future. And we should remember that we were slaves, and therefore, Alken Sifra Hashem Elokecha, we have to do the Shabbat. What does it mean to do the Shabbat? That we need to do it. What are we doing? You to observe the Shabbat day. That's not exactly a observe, is not what it says. La'asot et Shabbat. Bnei Yisrael v'shamru bnei Yisrael et Shabbat. La'asot et Shabbat. What does it mean to do the Shabbat? If God created the world in seven days, he did a great job. Now I have to continue to do the Shabbat. Doing the Shabbat means to translate the concept and the order of the world to my life, to my week, to my society. I do it. So the combination of both concepts, I believe that there are two different texts, one from Exodus and one 40 years later. And Moshe Rabbeinu, a very sensitive teacher who had a great understanding of his generation and of his students. He knew what they need to learn at the beginning out of Egypt and what they have to learn the day before they enter Eretz Yisrael. Two texts, but Chazal say it comes together. What's the message? If I understand that God is the Lord who created the world and therefore what he did, I'm, at, I'm little nobody, are allowed to do the same, in Sefer Dvarim, I'm not a little nobody anymore. I have to do the Shabbat. La'asot et Shabbat. In Shmot, God did it, and I rest, because he did it. And I'm a passive observer. No, I'm a passive observer of the Shabbat, because he did it. In Sefer Dvarim, I'm asked to do actively things. If I'm doing the Shabbat, I'm actually translating the concept of the creation to our world. Therefore, these are two different ideas, concepts, which merge together. And the unity of both ideas is a very strong message. Now it's time for us. We are not little children, slave who were just saved out of Egypt. We have now the full responsibility to continue la asotet Shabbat. So just do it. It's another concept. That is uh, Benno Jacob. Uh, thank you very much. 
Uh, Dr. Benny, does anyone else have uh, another question that they would like to ask? Okay, so then I think we will end this year. There are beautiful, beautiful comments. Um, and I just want to thank you in the name of Dr. Benny and Torah in Motion. I believe you have the partial class tonight um, at 8.30. And then you have uh, Rabbi Jay's class on Friday at 9.30 in the morning. And um, I want to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom and Rosh Chodesh is coming. So Chodesh Tov and a very happy and meaningful Chag HaShavuot. Thank you, Rabbi Benny. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Sudan. Thanks, everybody, for participating. And Chag Sameach. And we should continue learning in this way. If there are any comments, you will know how to find me online. Thank you. Thank you, Susan.